Great, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lloyd Ratner. I'm a transplant surgeon at Columbia University in the city of New York, where we are now undergoing a huge surge of uh, COVID-19 patients, and it's, it's really pretty scary. Uh, I'm also the president of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, and uh, I'd like to just start by, you know, uh, expressing my gratitude to uh, to Emily Blumberg and the AST staff and the AST community of practice for uh, really doing the lion's share of the work of, of uh, putting this together, and also for all the the uh, the the speakers and moderators who have participated in this. It's really been uh, this has been put together in a relatively short period of time, so. Kudos to all those involved. Uh, this portion of the webinar, we're going to talk about getting to transplant, donor issues, and candidate concerns. And we have five speakers, and I'll introduce them now and then let them do their thing successively. Our first speaker is Mike Isom, who probably needs no introduction, but he's a uh, transplant infectious disease doctor at Northwestern University in Chicago. Our second speaker will be Dr. Ajit Limay, who is also an infectious disease doctor at the University of Wisconsin. Our third speaker will be uh, Kevin O'Connor, who's the president and CEO of the Life Center Northwest, which is the, uh, the uh, organ procurement organization that serves the uh, North, the uh, the Northwest portion of the United States. Our fourth speaker will be Kelly Ranham, who's the CEO of the Louisiana Organ Procurement Organization, and she's also currently the AOPO president. And our fifth speaker will be Dr. Luciano Potina from the University of Bologna, who is associated with the cardiac transplant program there. So with that, let's move on to Mike uh, Isom's presentation, please. Great. Thanks, uh, and thanks uh, for uh, inviting me to present today. I do have some relevant disclosures. I'm a paid member of uh, the Medical Advisory Board of uh, Viracor, which is doing uh, coronavirus uh, testing, including for some OPOs, and I'm the current chair of the uh, NIH uh, DMID Adaptive Trial for Treatments uh, for COVID-19. Next slide. So what I was asked to talk about uh, today uh, is a little bit about uh, diagnostics and testing, and uh, specifically since it's in this uh, organ donation uh, realm, uh, data for its use there. The, the second part is actually pretty easy because there's very limited data that I've seen in terms of its uh, utility in that setting, so I'll just uh, be able to present to you uh, some information uh, that we have uh, from other data sets. Um, as far as diagnostics are, are concerned, for the most part, we are always talking about uh, PCR-based assays. Uh, for much of the world, there are some areas that have uh, 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 rapid antigen-type uh, kits as well as uh, antibody-based uh, kits, which will be coming along uh, uh, very shortly and uh, with FDA approval in the United States. Um, uh, for donor screening, though, PCR testing uh, is uh, the one that's uh, most available. Um, it's available uh, at uh, a number of different hospitals and commercial labs, uh, and I left the uh, FDA website where you can find the up-to-date list of uh, testing uh, sites. Uh, there are some limitations uh, to testing at this point. Um, there are variable availability of swabs, viral transport media, as well as availability of uh, the actual assays, and in many cases, uh, challenges uh, with turnaround time. Um, at our center, for example, those uh, tests that are done in-house, uh, which is currently uh, just shy of 100 tests per day, uh, we can get turnaround in about six hours, but for our ambulatory patients where it's sent to a reference lab, it's taking anywhere from one to three days to get the results back. The second question uh, that oftentimes come up is, what is the false negative result? There's been a wide range of uh, uh, rates that have been reported in the literature, anywhere from around 2% to 22%. Um, this is likely uh, very much dependent on uh, how the sample is collected. Uh, does someone get uh, a deep uh, collection uh, in the or, uh, nasal pharynx? Um, uh, is there good quality collection? 
our patients earlier late in the disease uh, where uh, utility of the uh, PCR-based test because of a relatively low viral load uh, may be uh, less. Uh, the sample site, so whether you're talking about upper or lower tract uh, uh, diseases, we'll talk about in a second, uh, as well as challenges potentially with lab assays or reagent uh, errors. Um, uh, the other uh, issue is where you're doing the test. Uh, we still have relatively limited data, um, but from what has been published by, by from the study uh, from China, um, the sensitivity of uh, uh, BAL fluid is 93%, uh, nasal swabs 63%, uh, and then uh, nasopharyngeal swabs of 32. So depending on where you get the susceptible, the, the testing, uh, you may get uh, a lower yields if you're uh, sampling the upper versus the lower respiratory tract. Um, again, these results are generally in patients that are relatively sick. I know we here at Northwestern have seen at least two patients with the severe lower tract disease where the uh, nasal swab was negative and the uh, lower tract was positive. Next slide. The uh, other thing which everyone is uh, quite familiar with, this is a little outdated. Uh, uh, the U.S. number is up to about 250,000 uh, tests that have been performed. Uh, but uh, the, the, one of the biggest challenges currently is uh, local testing availability. Uh, many sites are, are doing some hybrid of uh, local testing uh, and send out testing. Next uh, slide. Um, in terms of uh, who to test, so th this is uh, taken in part, and I'll probably turn it over to Ajit, um, uh, from what the guidance that they've provided about who to screen uh, from the uh, post-transplant side. Since we're talking about donor testing, I think uh, really it depends on uh, taking into consideration what uh, your OPO has available to you and what the uh, turnaround time has been. I know ROPO recently started uh, doing testing. Uh, there, it is sent to a reference lab uh, with uh, results generally uh, relatively quickly, although uh, uh, maybe uh, longer than uh, 12 hours. Um, uh, and so I think this is an area where we're going to need a lot more data uh, for understanding the uh, risk uh, of uh, false negatives in terms of how many patients test negative and uh, end up having disease transmitted to uh, recipients. Uh, and then uh, what is the yield uh, of this uh, in screening for uh, patients versus uh, loss of organs because of false positives. That's all that I have. Uh, thank you. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm back. Uh, despite rumors to the contrary, I am still at the University of Washington, that W and not Wisconsin. All right, I've been asked to just cover um, donor management strategies, but really what I'm going to focus in on uh, in the next slide, please, is a framework for thinking about um, decisions, difficult decisions, about whether to continue organ transplantation at your center. And obviously, this is a huge topic given the concerns that people have um, related to multiple aspects of, of transplantation, including some of the concerning clinical data shared by our Italian colleagues. And so this just provides some of the framework that we had in mind in thinking about our own transplant center's decision for at least now to continue with organ transplantation. And listed on the top two columns are uh, arguments in favor of maintaining um, the ability to, to uh, continue organ transplants as well as on the other side, arguments against um, uh, continuing transplantation. And the various domains that we thought through included some of the clinical aspects of transplantation, the impacts and ripple effect that go far beyond just the organ transplant population, particularly with constrained resources, with large numbers of patients in the community being admitted, financial considerations, legal considerations, and then finally, very importantly, ethical and moral obligations to patients who we list at our center for transplantation if we can do it safely. And at least for the present time, which is certainly subject to change as the situation changes, we have decided to continue um, performing organ transplantation uh, except in our living donor programs. And again, this is a fluid, dynamic situation that may well change if, for example, we don't have enough PPE or other kinds of things. But 
one of the clinical factors that we thought about is since much of the concern about what the impact that COVID would have, uh, specifically in our organ transplant populations, we considered what would happen to our patients if they did not receive a life-saving transplant, including very high mortality rates for some of our sicker patients awaiting, for example, lung, liver, or heart transplants, and the fact that if we deferred transplantation, they would likely remain at risk through their multiple hospital and medical center uh, contacts and, and potential risks of nosocomial infection. So I think each center should carefully consider um, whether or not to continue with transplantation. And this, again, provides just one uh, conceptual framework for thinking about what might go into that decision. Next slide, please. One of the major concerns about transplantation, obviously uh, a number of factors as shown in the previous slide, but is can we transmit SARS-CoV-2 from the donor to the recipient? And I think really we don't have a definitive answer for that, and so this provides at least through a critical literature review um, what available data there are that either suggest the possibility of transmission uh, on the left side and the arguments against or data um, suggesting that transmission may not occur at least to certain non-lung, non-GI organs. I think the data published from uh, Wuhan and Chinese investigators have pretty clearly shown that um, both viable virus, culturable viruses present in stool and there is obviously as the major target organ, the lung, uh, a high level of concern about transmission in an uh, unknowingly infected uh, donor. However, our estimation based on the available data to date and drawing from analogies from what we know about other RNA respiratory viruses, including some close cousins of SARS-CoV-2, namely MERS and uh, SARS from 2003, that the risk for transmission of active infection from a donor may vary significantly when one considers GI uh, tract-related organs and lung organs versus non-lung organs. And I think that should be kept in consideration, particularly in the discussions about access to testing for donors that Dr. Eisen uh, had just alluded to. All right, next slide, please. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you for this opportunity um, to review some of the donor strategies. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the testing. I think that's been well covered by Dr. Zeisen and Dr. LeMay. Um, I am going to spend some time talking about maybe five or six things that I think all of us working on the organ donation side can anticipate and should be prepared for. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to just give an overview of, of the general approach that we're taking to the screening of potential organ donors. Um, all of OPOs in the United States and elsewhere are striving to balance their uh, ability to carry out their mission and provide, maximize the number of organs available to the transplant community with efforts to mitigate the risk of disease transmission, obviously for patients, for the healthcare team, for OPO staff, and for recovery surgeons. So we're all uh, in the same boat uh, in that regard. Our routine screening now across the country includes the, um, the Uniform uh, Donor Risk Assessment Interview, which includes uh, qu specific questions related to medical, behavioral, travel, social history that would be uh, potentially suggestive of, of uh, increased risk of exposure uh, to, uh, to the virus. Um, we ask specific questions about whether or not there has been any history of signs or symptoms such as a fever, cough, shortness of breath, or evidence of lower respiratory tract disease. Um, and of course, look at the epidemiologic risk factors related to recent travel in particular. And also uh, ask specific questions now as part of this uniform donor risk assessment interview related to whether or not there's been a, a risk of exposure to a person under investigation for being infected with, uh, with this virus. We also, um, uh, in, in many parts of the country and some OPOs routinely now are doing chest CTs to uh, determine whether or not there are CT findings that might be consistent with or are, are suggestive of uh, exposure to the virus. 
in addition to the, uh, the the test results that we're obtaining. And of course, that's going to be to some extent a function of uh, where in the disease progression we're doing the uh, the, the CT, um, uh, and that's going to vary from case to case. As far as the testing goes, I think the one of the uh, current challenges we're faced with is, is that most of us, I believe, are leaning towards trying to do universal or routine testing on all potential organ donors, but there are challenges for many OPOs. They don't have access to a testing platform locally, um, and in some cases, uh, they need to send specimens uh, uh, across quite a distance, uh, which then can translate into several days of t waiting time for the turnaround for the result to be available to them. So while we're not there yet uh, in the United States where every OPO is universally testing every potential organ donor, I think it's safe to say that we're rapidly moving in that direction. Um, some of us, uh, like here in Seattle, are lucky enough to have the local uh, testing facility. We're working closely with Dr. LeMay and his team, and I want to uh, just acknowledge uh, Dr. LeMay for his uh, leadership and his uh, willingness to partner closely with the OPO uh, in this instance, uh, so that both the University of Washington Medical Center Transplant Program and uh, Life Center Northwest as the local OPO are working hand in glove to make sure that we're maximizing every opportunity for donation and transplantation by making uh, testing available to us, not only available to us locally, but also prioritizing uh, our testing so that those results are turned around to us generally in less than 18 hours. Um, there's already been a discussion about the, the various types of specimens. I think the only comment I would add there is that um, we do the, we have the uh, hospital staff, the healthcare team in the hospital obtain the specimens for us. And then we do the testing um, outside of the of the normal internal uh, testing protocol of each of our donor hospitals, and so that um, that helps sort of um, um, protect against uh, concerns that otherwise the hospital might have when, uh, if they're doing testing on an inpatient, they would have to put that patient in isolation and that sort of thing. So we found that to be a useful um, way to uh, get around that particular challenge. Um, as far as the as the um, things that I think. Uh, we would like to share with the rest of the OPOs based on our uh, experience with uh, more of an early surge uh, of this uh, virus here in the Northwest is that you uh, can and should expect there will be eventually shortages of, of PPE. We've already heard some comments along those lines. Uh, we're seeing some extreme shortages of PPE in our hospitals now. So we've actually created an, uh, kits uh, for our staff to take on site with them. And we've uh, we've sent those to all of our uh, coordinators and all of our staff who are going to be spending time in the hospital, um, so they can bring in their own masks, their own gloves, their own gowns, as needed. Uh, we're and and so that's something that is, uh, I think would would make sense for others to begin to prepare for. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in restrictions of access uh, to our hospitals, so we try very much to limit the number of staff who are actually entering the hospital at any point in time, and we're using uh, remote uh, communication technology like telephone or Skype or FaceTime or other technologies to the extent that we can uh, to minimize the uh, number of staff from the OPO who are present in the hospital. That being said, obviously, uh, when and if we need to have people at the bedside or in the operating room, uh, we're not uh, in any way um, minimizing that presence. But otherwise, we're just trying to do the right thing. Uh, the third thing I think we can anticipate is uh, travel restrictions. I know I read recently um, in the New York City area now the staff are actually being stopped uh, on the roads and that sort of thing to with, uh, uh, with inquiries as to where they're traveling to. And I think uh, providing our staff with um, some documentation uh, of the nature of the life-saving work they're involved with is uh, prudent and will be helpful going forward as more and more of us are encountering these types of restrictions. The other restrictions that we're seeing, especially up in this part of the country now, are restrictions placed by state governments, um, alerts from the governor's offices, and uh, mandates regarding uh, what medical procedures should be uh, suspended. So uh, what we've done, what we're doing is reaching out directly to our uh, state governments and state departments of health uh, to get their support in writing for our staff. Um, CMS has, has categorized that transplant surgery uh, as a tier 3B uh, procedure, which is a do not postpone category. And we're making sure our staff are, are prepared with uh, that documentation so that uh, when uh, hospitals begin to question uh, whether or not donation is a is a um, critical, essential medical procedure, we're able to um, support ourselves and move things along. Um, another another thing to be, bear in mind is that um, hospitals are restricting are restricting who can enter 
Um, and so we have, are trying to, to the greatest extent possible, provide uh, local recovery staff for organs that are going to be sent out of our DSA. And I know this is happening elsewhere around the country more and more. Um, but I think uh, as we continue forward into the in this situation, we're going to need to rely more heavily on having our local recovery teams recover organs and send them to distant centers. And lastly, um, there's increasing pressure from our hospitals to move our cases along more rapidly. Uh, there's obviously growing competition for ventilators and for ICU beds. And so I think we should be anticipating and preparing for uh, being able to move the donation process along uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, while balancing the need to do the appropriate testing and the appropriate evaluation and place the maximum number of organs. So again, that's uh, all I have for now. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I won't add much more, but um, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can, uh, Kelly. Okay, great. Those of us with uh, donor care centers are uh, working uh, rapidly with our hospitals to transfer those patients once authorization occurs uh, to the donor care centers. Uh, we are seeing um, a few more uh, issues with DCD because of the vent shortages, uh, OR shutdowns, and the time constraints that Kevin addressed as well. Um, and I think that really just kind of minimizing our staff exposure, using telemedicine when, when um, able, huddling with the staff that way, trying to, to just decrease the burden on the hospitals is, is what the OPOs are, are working towards. So that's all I have to add to Kevin. Um, hello, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you for uh, putting this uh, together. and. Um, I will be happy to present uh, the protocol we are trying to implement in Bologna to address the issue of managing the candidates uh, during these uh, COVID uh, outbreaks. So please, the, the next slide. So um, as, as also has been anticipated earlier, uh, um, to uh, start thinking about uh, how to manage a, a transplant program and in particular uh, heart transplant program and lung transplant program in, in your hospital you should start uh, to put to take yourself uh, some questions so the first is if you have a covid free path in the hospital uh, if you have screening facilities for the donor we we have heard uh, that uh, in, in us opos are able to in in multiple cases to to have uh, screening facilities for the donor in Italy, we started to screen all the donors uh, by the end of February with uh, a PCR in the Bay AL and now also with CT scan. Uh, also, it's important to consider how prevalent is the SARS-COVID uh, in the uh, recipient area, because if the recipient is coming from a, a very high prevalent area or not, how sick is the recipient, because we have to weigh uh, how is really life-saving that potential donor for that potential recipient and if we have the possibility to screen the recipient because we need to consider how to uh, rule out uh, the possibility of having of having COVID in our recipient also take into consideration that if we live in a, a high prevalent area of COVID in just for instance to make you the case in uh, in my area currently we have a prevalence of one case every 500 people one confirmed case is every 500 people considering that the uh, pcr is done only in symptomatic patients so we may have one case one person out of 100 patient 100 subject that can be affected in our area currently so it's quite highly prevalent so it's important to screen the patients knowing that we cannot rule out completely that is covid free so the next one, please. So we need to balance the risk of transplanting a COVID recipient and the risk of a COVID transmission in the post-operative period with the risk of the patient to risk the transplant. So this is uh, how, and this is of, often is a gamble. So how COVID-free is my ICU? How can I ensure to my recipient to skip 
to avoid the possibility to get the infection in the early post-transplant post phase. Another alternative is, do we really have alternative? For example, if we have COVID-free path, considering using an LVAT for heart transplant recipient may be an option, uh, only because we don't have immunosuppression. But again, we don't have data on LVAT patients infected by COVID. And on the other hand, another important issue is to consider to accept only good organs to minimize the risk of early graft dysfunction and long ICU stay. Uh, we have uh, been discussing a lot in the community, in the heart transplant community in particular, the acceptance of marginal organs. In this case, uh, in during a COVID outbreak with the uh, uh, ICU shortage of staff, I think it's not a good idea to accept a marginal organ with an anticipated long ICU stay. So we should focus, if we really want to, to go on with the transplant program on, on very good, very good organs. Uh, next one. This is my uh, last slide and very briefly, uh, you, you can screenshot it uh, very briefly, is uh, the, the protocol we have for the screening uh, uh, of our potential recipient for heart or lung uh, transplantation. Basically, if we have the recipient that is already in hospital and is in on high urgency, we uh, uh, um, periodically screen the patient with a CT scan and with swab. If both are negative, uh, he is on the waiting list. If one of the two is not negative, we withhold the patients from the waiting list. Uh, it can be more complicated if we uh, consider a patient arriving from home. So first of all, we have to uh, do uh, uh, we have to perform a phone triage of the patient to screen and to and to write a note of the screening. It's important to have a document of the screening to check for fever if the patients had or had, had or had not any upper respiratory symptoms uh, in the preceding two weeks. Uh, and if the patients had, we would not proceed with transplant and re-evaluate re the patient. If he declared he didn't have, we uh, accept the patient with face mask entering the hospital. We again rescreen for fever and upper uh, trait infection upon admittance. If no, if everything is clear, we perform a CT scan uh, to, to look for interstitial pneumonia. Uh, we uh, decided to go for TC CT scan screening because the turnaround time for a, a swab is still too long in our hospital. We are now taking a fast uh, PCR screening, but this fast PCR screening uh, they have a faster turnaround time, but they may, they may be uh, less sensitive in non-symptomatic patients. So our idea and our recommendation would be to do the CT scan anyway, and then if you have a rapid, uh, a rapid uh, uh, PCR technique, you can use the rapid PCR technique, and then to proceed for transplant. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you to the presenters. I actually have a couple of questions because this is really, we're really in the meat of what, you know, the information that we've been getting from our state and local and authorities and our hospitals and all. Um, this is really, that's been less specific. This is more specific to transplant. So first, let me ask, pose a question to Mike. Um, what is going on with the, with uh, the risk of uh, transmission through blood transfusions, or how's the the screening for blood donors, and what's the blood availability uh, impact of uh, of the, the coronavirus? So, what I would say is the biggest impact is likely uh, not so much the uh, impact of uh, donor uh, derived uh, uh, coronavirus through blood but absolute availability of blood. I know in our area, we're in critically critical shortage of platelets, for example, uh, because people are just not going for uh, to donate uh, blood and blood products. And so I think that this is something that 
all transplant centers need to probably have open dialogue with their blood banks uh, to just assess uh, for ongoing availability. In terms of uh, a relative risk, I think as Ajit pointed out, we don't have a lot of data uh, on uh, risk of transmission. Blood screening and deferral is very different um, from uh, uh, organ transplantation in that uh, blood and products uh, collected for blood, oftentimes uh, retained for a short period of time, uh, 24 hours or such, uh, to make sure that the patient is uh, without symptoms while other tests are ongoing. Um, for example, we had uh, one instance uh, where a patient uh, donated blood and the following day uh, became ill uh, and tested positive for coronavirus. So that uh, blood product was uh, uh, quarantined and disposed of. Um, so it's a bit of a different uh, 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 level of risk from uh, blood uh, donation. Uh, and we really don't have uh, uh, good data on uh, frequency of uh, transmission of these viruses. I think that uh, respiratory viruses oftentimes don't have uh, significant uh, viremia for seasonal viruses, uh, so the risk is very low. The frequency of uh, viremia or RNAemia uh, in uh, these uh, patients when they're severely ill is relatively infrequent. We have very little data on patients that have uh, mild or asymptomatic disease to really inform that uh, spot. Thank you. Let me ask a, a question to Ajit. Um, so in our, in New York, we're just undergoing, we're beginning of the surge. And at our center, it looks like there may be a couple of patients who have, uh, were inpatients and, and uh, on the transplant service and then got exposed nosocomially and now have tested positive. Uh, what are your recommendations in terms of best practices to avoid nosocomial infections? Uh, Lloyd, it looks like Ajit might be self-muted right now. Ajit, can you hear us? If hear you. Yes, I hopefully I'm unmuted now. You, are um, correct. you raised correct. a good question, Dr. Ratner, and I think Dr. Michaels brought up some of the strategies that hospitals have used from, you know, adhering to recommended CDC uh, guidance about infection prevention. Our hospital has gone to a, um, a cohort strategy, at least for some patients, where there's a separate ward with patients who have tested uh, positive uh, for COVID. Um, you know, it is concerning that you're describing what sounds like nosocomial transmission. We have not, to our knowledge, have had patients acquire COVID while in the hospital. Um, and I'm somewhat encouraged by the Singapore and Taiwan experience, at least initially, that with very rigorous uh, infection prevention measures, that they were able to control at least transmission within the nosocomial setting. The community setting is completely different. So our general approach is in any patient as described by Dr. Potena that is suspected of possibly being symptomatic who is uh, getting ready to go to transplant, they would be screened. And anyone who has either laboratory or other clinical suspicion um, for COVID would not uh, be able to undergo transplant unless that's uh, adequately excluded, both by clinical symptoms, epi risks, laboratory testing, CT scan. Great, thank you. And in the interest of time, let me just pose one last question to, to uh, Kevin. Uh, uh, when the standard questions are asked of the donors, is there a standard way that it's reported in the in donor net? Because at three in the morning, I haven't been able to find that so easily. Yeah, I I I know that we are recording it in our in our uh, OPO EMR, and I I think that my recommendation would be that I I'm sure that every OPO is asking those specific questions. My recommendation would be that if you're uh, entertaining an offer, is that you contact the OPO if you are unable to find the answers to those questions because they will have those answers for you. My my recommendation would be to you know is to make standard fields for those questions, just like you have for serologies. I think it would be very useful for those of us who are accepting the organ offers. 